Hello, STAT 200. Welcome to the full video lecture for Lesson 8, Inference for One Sample. In this lesson, we are going to learn how we can apply common distributions, such as the Z and T distributions, to construct confidence intervals and to conduct hypothesis tests. This builds on what we learned in Lesson 7, but we will no longer be relying on the bootstrapping or randomization distributions that we had been making in STAT Key. Now, we'll be using formulas. Before we get started with new content, I want to review a couple of points. We saw both of these formulas last week in Lesson 7. The general form of a confidence interval is the sample statistic plus and minus the Z multiplier times the standard error. This week, we're just working with one sample, so the sample statistic could be a sample proportion or a sample mean. The Z multiplier comes from the Z distribution. For example, for a 95% confidence interval, the Z multiplier would be the Z value that separates the middle 95% from the outer 5%. The standard error in lesson seven, we were taking from a bootstrapping distribution. This week, we'll learn some formulas that we can use to compute the standard error mathematically. The general form of a test statistic is the sample statistic minus the null parameter divided by the standard error. This week, we're working with one sample. The sample statistic could be the proportion or the mean in the sample. The null parameter is the value in the null hypothesis. You could also call this the hypothesized population parameter. And the standard error in lesson seven, we found on a randomization distribution, but this week we'll compute using formulas. Let's review the learning objectives. This will be a longer video because we'll see a lot of slightly different examples, both by hand and using Minitab Express. The general formulas that you see here will be applied for all three parameters that we'll see this week, which are one proportion, one mean, and paired means. These are all of the learning objectives that we're going to cover in this lesson. I know it looks like a lot, but remember that most of this is built on what you've already learned in Lesson 7, and a lot of these learning objectives are very similar. For example, objectives 2 and 3 are the same. It's just that in 2, we're doing it by hand, and in 3, we're using Minitab Express. Objectives 5 and 6 are also the same, except 5 uses hand calculations and 6 uses Minitab Express. Here's the blueprint for everything that we're going to cover in this video. Note the pattern here. We're going to be going through all six learning objectives for one proportion, then for one mean, and finally for paired means. You should see a lot of similarities across the methods used for these three parameters. One thing I should point out is that the first objective does vary slightly depending on the parameter. For one proportion, we'll see the Z distribution again. But for one mean and paired means, we'll look at a new distribution, the T distribution, which is similar to the Z distribution, but does vary slightly depending on the sample size. If you open this video on YouTube, in the description below the video, you can find timestamps if you want to jump ahead to see a specific example. Let's get started with exploring inference for one proportion. First, for one proportion, we will identify situations in which the Z distribution may be used to approximate the sampling distribution. We started doing this last week in Lesson 7. When the bootstrapping or randomization distribution was approximately normal, we used the Z distribution. Last week, we just looked at the sampling distribution and visually judged whether or not it was approximately normal. Now, I'll show you some more objective guidelines. If n times p is at least 10, and if n times 1 minus p is at least 10, then we can use the z distribution to approximate the sampling distribution when we're constructing a confidence interval or conducting a hypothesis test. Note that n times p is the number of successes, and n times 1 minus p is the number of failures. This is known as the rule of sample proportions. Recall from last week, we said if the sample size is sufficiently large, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. 
This is defining what we mean by sufficiently large when we're working with one proportion. When these conditions are met, you should use the z-distribution. This is known as the normal approximation method. If assumptions are met, the sampling distribution will have a standard deviation or standard error equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n. While this version of the formula is written in terms of the population proportion, we'll see that when we're constructing confidence intervals, we'll use the sample proportion as an estimate. And when conducting hypothesis tests, we'll use the hypothesized population parameter. Our second learning objective is to construct a confidence interval for a proportion by hand given summary data. We're going to be doing this using the normal approximation method only. In order to use the normal approximation method, we do have that assumption. Both n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat must be at least 10. Note that here we're using p hat instead of p like we saw in the last slides. That's because we don't have the population proportion. When we're constructing a confidence interval, we only have sample data. We use the sample proportion to estimate the population proportion. If this assumption is not met, you can bootstrap, which we learned in lesson four, or use the exact method, which is not covered by hand in this course. Let's look at the formula that we'll be using to construct a confidence interval for a proportion. Here we have the general form of a confidence interval. We saw this last week, as well as back in lesson four. A confidence interval is computed by taking the sample statistic, plus and minus the multiplier times the standard error. For a single proportion, the sample statistic is the sample proportion. The multiplier will come from the z-distribution, and the standard error will be computed using the sample proportion. Let's walk through a couple of quick examples. In a random sample of 50 customers, 34 were women. Construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all customers who are women. We'll start by checking the assumption that both n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat are at least 10. This means that there are at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures in the sample. We are estimating the proportion who are women, so n times p hat is the 34 women in the sample. Note that this is equivalent to doing n times p hat. If you did out all of the math, the 50s would just cross out and you'd be left with the number of successes n times 1 minus p hat are the number of people in the sample who are not women. Again, you could do out all of the math, but you would end up with the same result. Both of these values are at least 10, which means that we can continue to use the normal approximation method. Here's our formula. p hat is our sample proportion. 34 out of 50 were women for a sample proportion of 0.68. The z multiplier we can find by constructing a z distribution and finding the z scores that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. If you need a review of how to find these values, go back to lesson seven. The 95% confidence level is the most common level. The z multiplier is 1.960. And the sample size, n, is 50. Now we have all of the values that we need to construct this confidence interval. When you're doing these calculations by hand, try not to round too much. I use a TI-30XS calculator, and it has an A and S button that I can use to pull down the previous values. That way, there is no rounding until the very end. If you're rounding at each stage, your final answer may be off. We get a 95% confidence interval here of 0.551 to 0.809. I am 95% confident that the proportion of all customers who are women is between 
0 0.551, and 0 0.809. Here's one last example. In a random sample of 100 students, 88 passed the course. Construct a 98% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all students who passed the course. We'll start by checking the assumption that both n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat are at least 10. This means that there are at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures in the sample. We are estimating the proportion of students who passed. In this sample, 88 students passed, which means that 12 students did not pass. Both of these values are at least 10, so we can use the normal approximation method. Here's our formula. The sample proportion is 88 over 100. To find the z-multiplier, we construct a z-distribution to find the z-scores that separate the middle 98% from the outer 2%. Again, if you need a review of this, see Lesson 7. Our z-multiplier here is 2.326, and the sample size n is 100. We plug these values into our formula. Our 98% confidence interval is 0 0.804 to 0 0.956. I am 98% confident that the proportion of all students who pass the course is between 0.804 and 0.956. Next, I'll show you how to walk through the same example in Minitab Express. In this case, we have summarized data. The information that we'll need are the sample size of 100, the number of successes of 88, and the confidence level of 98%. The directions are very similar for PCs and Macs. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, One Sample, Proportion. If you're on a Mac, go to Statistics, One Sample Inference, Proportion. The default in Minitab Express is that sample data are in a column. That means that you have raw data in one column of your worksheet. But in this case, we have summarized data. The number of events is the number of successes, and the number of trials is the total sample size. In our example, 88 out of 100 students in the sample passed. Under options, we need to change the confidence level. The default is to construct a 95% confidence interval, but in this example, we wanted a 98% confidence interval. We also need to change the method. The default method in Minitab Express is the exact method. This uses a binomial distribution. We already checked assumptions, so we know that we have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. When these assumptions are met, we use the normal approximation method. Click OK. And here's our 98% confidence interval for the population proportion. We just saw how we can construct a confidence interval for a proportion using Minitab Express given summary data. Next, we'll construct a confidence interval for a proportion using raw data. I'm going to use one of the data sets that comes with your textbook, which is also available at this link. For this example, I'll use the bike commute data set. When you open the MTW file, it should open in Minitab Express if you have it installed on your computer. I want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all bikes that are carbon. Before I construct the confidence interval, I need to check that there are at least 10 carbon and at least 10 non-carbon bikes in this sample. To do that, I'll construct a frequency table. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, Describe, Tally. 
If you're on a Mac, it would be statistics, summary statistics, tally. The variable I'm interested in is labeled bike, and I just need the counts. In this sample, there are 26 carbon bikes and 30 steel. With at least 10 in each group, the assumption is met and I can use the normal approximation method. Just like when we had summary data, I'll go to statistics, one sample, proportion. Now we do have sample data in a column. That column is bike. I said that I wanted to estimate the proportion that are carbon, so the event that I'm estimating is carbon. Under options, I am constructing a 95% confidence interval, but I do need to change the method. The assumptions were met, so I'm going to use the normal approximation method. Here is our 95% confidence interval for the population proportion. I am 95% confident that the proportion of all bikes in the population that are carbon is between 0.333665 and 0.594907. Our fourth learning objective is to determine the necessary minimum sample size to construct a confidence interval for a proportion. Unfortunately, this is not something that many Tab Express will compute. We will need to do these calculations by hand. This is the formula that we're going to be using. I don't want to go too far into how this formula was derived, but for those of you who are interested, it's derived from this. M is the margin of error. That's the part of the confidence interval formula that is added and subtracted from the sample statistic. The formula that we're going to be using to compute the minimum necessary sample size rearranges this formula to solve for n. In this formula, we also have z, which is the z multiplier, and p with a tilde. This is the estimated value of the population proportion. Often, when we're determining the necessary sample size, we don't even have sample data yet. If you have no estimate of p, use p tilde of 0 0.50, because that is the most conservative estimate. That means that it will give us the largest possible sample size calculation. Let's look at a couple of examples. We want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all customers who are women with a margin of error of plus or minus 2%. In a previous study, 68% were women. Let's start by considering the information that we're given in this scenario. We're told that the confidence level is 95%. That's going to impact our Z multiplier. The Z multiplier for a 95% confidence interval can be found by constructing a Z distribution and finding the Z scores that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. If you need a review of this, go back to Lesson 7. For a 95% confidence interval, the Z multiplier is 1.960. We're given a margin of error of 2%, but remember that we're working with proportions, so M equals 0 0.02. And we have an estimated population proportion from a previous study, which translates to P tilde equals 0 0.68. We plug these values into the formula, and we get n equals 2089.830. We cannot have a fraction of a person in our sample, so we always round up to the next whole number. Here, the minimum necessary sample size is 2090. I'll do one more example. We want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the proportion of all STAT 200 students who own a dog with a margin of error of plus or minus 5%. Again, we have a 95% confidence interval. We'll use a Z multiplier 
of 1.960. The margin of error we were given to be 5%, which translates to a proportion of 0 0.05. We were not given an estimate of the population proportion. Remember that if you have no estimate of P, use a P tilde of 0 0.50. We plug these values into our formula and get 384.16. We round up. We should obtain a minimum necessary sample size of 385 students. Our fifth learning objective for one proportion is to conduct a hypothesis test by hand given summary data. We are going to continue to use the same five-step hypothesis testing procedure from last week. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption is that n times p sub o is greater than or equal to 10, and n times one minus p sub o is greater than or equal to 10. p sub o is the hypothesized population proportion. This is the value in the hypotheses. We use this value here because the sampling distribution is constructed given that the null hypothesis is true. The hypotheses are written just as they were in lesson five. Remember that P sub O here is the hypothesized population proportion. Your actual hypotheses will not say P sub O, they'll have a number there. That value you usually get from your research question. Step two, calculate the test statistic. This is the formula that we'll use. We can compare this to the general form of a test statistic. In the numerator, we have the sample statistic minus the null parameter. In the denominator, we have the standard error. Remember that in hypothesis testing, the sampling distribution is constructed given that the null hypothesis is true. And that's why the standard error here uses P sub O. Step three, determine the p-value. Given that the null hypothesis is true, the p-value is the probability that a randomly selected sample of n would have a sample proportion as different or more different than the one in our sample in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Note that p-values are also symbolized as p. Do not confuse the p-value with the population proportion, which shares the same symbol. We can look up the p-value using Minitab Express. We'll construct a z-distribution. The p-value will be the area under the z-distribution that is more extreme than the test statistic we computed in step two in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. For example, if we had a left-tailed test, the p-value would be the area less than our z-test statistic. If we had a right-tailed test, the p-value would be the area greater than our z-test statistic. And if we had a two-tail test, the p-value would be the area in the left and the right tails combined. Step four, make a decision. If the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, which in most cases is 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state a real world conclusion. This is where we go back to the original research question and state whether or not we have evidence of the hypothesized difference. Again, this is using the same rules that we learned in lesson five and saw again last week in lesson seven. If you rejected the null hypothesis, then the results are statistically significant and there is evidence of a difference in the population. You would go back to the research question or hypotheses to determine if that difference is right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed. In other words, if there's evidence that the parameter is greater than the given value, less than the given value, or different from the given value. If you failed to reject the null hypothesis, then the results are not statistically significant and there is not evidence of a difference in the population. I'll walk through one example now. There are additional examples in the online notes. Whenever possible, though, I recommend using Minitab Express, which we'll see in the next learning objective. Here's our research question. 
is the proportion of all World Campus STAT 200 students who are women different from 0.5? In a representative sample of 100 students, 54 were women. Let's use the five-step hypothesis testing procedure to address this research question. Step 1. Check assumptions and write hypotheses. I'm going to start by writing hypotheses because we can't check assumptions until we know what P sub O is. We want to know if the proportion in the population is different from 0.5. Our null hypothesis is that P equals 0.5, and our alternative hypothesis is that P is not equal to 0.5. Now we have identified P sub O as being 0.5. We can use that value to check these assumptions. N is the total sample size of 100. N times P sub L equals 100 times 0 0.5, which is 50. N times 1 minus P sub L also equals 50. Both of these values are at least 10, so we can use the normal approximation method here. Step 2, calculate the test statistic. Here's our formula. P hat is the proportion in the sample. 54 out of 100 students were women for a sample proportion of 0.54. P sub O is the hypothesized population proportion. That's the value in the hypotheses, 0.5. And N is the total sample size of 100. We plug these values into the formula. and end up with a z-test statistic of 0 0.8. Step 3, determine the p-value. We're going to use Minitab Express to draw a z-distribution. Recall that the p-value is the area that is more extreme than the test statistic in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. This is a two-tailed test, so the p-value will be the area greater than 0 0.8 plus the area less than negative 0.8. I'll take you over to Minitab Express now to find that p-value. I'm going to construct a probability distribution plot to display a probability. I'll construct a z-distribution, which is a normal distribution, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1, my z-test statistic is a specified x-value. We have a two-tailed test, so the p-value will be equally split between the two tails, and a z-test statistic of 0 0.8. The p-value is the area in the left and the right tails added together. 0 0.211855 plus 0 0.211855 gives us a p-value of 0 0.42371. Step 4, make a decision. Our p-value is greater than the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. In step 5, state a real-world conclusion. We failed to reject the null hypothesis, there is not evidence that the proportion of all World Campus STAT 200 students who are women is different from 0 0.5. There are a few additional examples in the online notes. Whenever possible, though, you should try to use Minitab Express to calculate the test statistic, as it will automatically give you the p-value. And that's what I'm going to show you next. Our sixth learning objective for one proportion is to conduct a hypothesis test using Minitab Express given summary or raw data. We're going to be using the same five-step hypothesis testing procedure. You will need to manually check assumptions and determine your hypotheses, but Minitab Express will compute the test statistic and p-value for you. Let's walk through an example using summary data first. Our research question is, are more than half of all students working full-time? In a random sample of 50 students, 29 were working full-time. Step 1, check assumptions and write hypotheses. 
We'll start by writing hypotheses. We want to know if more than half are working full time. That means that the population proportion will be greater than 0.5. Our null hypothesis is that P equals 0.5, and our alternative hypothesis is that P is greater than 0.5. Next, we check assumptions. In order to use the normal approximation method, both n times p sub o and n times 1 minus p sub o must be at least 10. n is the sample size of 50, p sub o is the hypothesized population proportion of 0 0.5, n times p sub o equals 25, and n times 1 minus p sub o also equals 25. Step 2, calculate the test statistic. This is where I'm going to take you to Minitab Express. The directions are very similar for PCs and Macs. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, One Sample, Proportion. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, One Sample, Inference, Proportion. The default in Minitab Express is that sample data are in a column. That means that you have raw data in one column of your worksheet. In this case, we have summarized data. The number of events is the number of successes, and the number of trials is your total sample size. In our example, 29 out of 50 students were working full time. Now we have to check the box to perform a hypothesis test. Our null hypothesis was that P equals 0 0.5. Under options, the default is to do a two-tailed test. In our case, we had a right-tailed alternative hypothesis. We said P was greater than 0 0.5. We can keep the default confidence level. For method, the assumptions were met to use the normal approximation method. We need to remember to change this, otherwise Minitab Express will use a binomial distribution instead of a Z distribution. Click OK. We can confirm that we entered the data correctly. 29 out of 50 were working full time. And we can confirm that our hypotheses are correct. We have a right tail test. Our Z test statistic is 1.13 and our p-value is 0 0.1289. This is steps two and three of the five-step hypothesis testing procedure. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides to finish with steps four and five. When you're working through these steps on the lab assignment, be sure to copy and paste your Minitab Express output that shows the Z value and the P value. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value was greater than the standard 0.05 alpha level, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Step 5, state a real-world conclusion. Because we failed to reject the null, there is not evidence that more than half of all students are working full-time. I'll do one more example using Minitab Express. This time, I'll use raw data. I'll use the bike commute data set from the LOC5 textbook again. My research question is, is the proportion of all bikes that are steel different from 0 0.5? I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, One Sample, Proportion. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, One Sample Inference, Proportion. Now, we do have sample data in a column. Our data are in the bike column, and my research question was written in terms of steel. We need to check the perform hypothesis text box. Our null hypothesis was that P equals 0 0.5. Under options, we do have a two-tailed test. We haven't checked assumptions yet, but I'm going to set this to the normal approximation method so that Minitab Express gives us the Z-test statistic. 
I'll use the output to check the assumption before I try to interpret the test statistic and p-value though. Click OK. We have our output. Step one, we need to go back to check assumptions and to write hypotheses. We wanted to know if the population proportion was different from 0 0.5. Our null hypothesis is that p equals 0 0.5 and our alternative is that p does not equal 0.5. Now we check assumptions. The sample size we can see was 56. 56 times 0.5 is 23. n times 1 minus p sub o is 56 times 1 minus 0.5, which is also 23. Both of these values are at least 10, so we can use the normal approximation method. Step two, compute the test statistic. Our output tells us that Z equals 0 0.53. Step three, determine the p-value. The p-value here is 0 0.5930. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value is greater than the standard 0.05 alpha level. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state a real-world conclusion. There is not evidence that the proportion of all bikes that are steel is different from 0.5. We just covered all of the learning objectives for one proportion. Now is a good time to take a break. One proportion confidence intervals and tests are covered in section 6.1 of the LOC5 textbook. You may want to go to Wiley Plus to do all of the questions that are tied to chapter 6, section 1, before you move on to the next section. Now, we're going to go through the same six learning objectives with one mean. I know it seems like a lot of content, but pay attention to the similarities. The first learning objective associated with one mean is to identify situations in which the t-distribution may be used to approximate the sampling distribution. This is the first time that we've seen or heard of the t-distribution in this course. Here are two examples of t-distributions. Like the z-distribution, the t-distribution is always symmetrical. The main difference is that the t-distribution varies depending on the degrees of freedom. On the left, we have four degrees of freedom, and on the right, we have 100 degrees of freedom. The way that the degrees of freedom are calculated is different for different parameters. For one mean, the degrees of freedom, or df, equals n minus one. Here, we have these two distributions on top of each other so you can see the difference. When the degrees of freedom are 4, the distribution is not as high in the center as when the degrees of freedom are 100. The height of the tails is also different. With 4 degrees of freedom, the tails are higher. Next, I'll show you how these distributions compare to the z distribution. On the left, we're comparing a z-distribution in the solid blue line to a t-distribution with four degrees of freedom in the dashed red line. Compared to the z-distribution, the t-distribution with four degrees of freedom is lower in the middle and higher in the tails. On the right, we're comparing a z-distribution to a t-distribution with 100 degrees of freedom. Here, the distributions are almost identical. As degrees of freedom increase, the t-distribution becomes more and more similar to the z-distribution. When we're constructing confidence intervals for a mean or conducting a hypothesis test for a mean, we'll use the t-distribution in many cases. But there are some assumptions that must be met. Here is a flowchart from the online notes that shows when to use the t-distribution. The first question we ask is, is the population known to be normally distributed? If yes, then we ask, is the population standard deviation known? If yes, then we use a Z distribution. There is an optional section in the online notes that walks through one sample mean Z tests. 
We won't be covering this test in this course though because it's rarely appropriate to use. If you're majoring in psychology, you may see it used with standardized tests or IQ scores where the test is normed to have a certain standard deviation. Let's take a step back. If we said yes, the population is known to be normally distributed, but no, the population standard deviation is not known, then we would use the t-distribution. This is the method we'll be focusing on in this lesson because you would also use it in cases where the population is not known to be normally distributed, but the sample size is at least 30. This is probably the most common case. This decision is based on the central limit theorem. According to the central limit theorem, which we were introduced to in lesson seven, if the sample size is sufficiently large, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. Here, we're learning that for one sample mean, sufficiently large is at least 30. So regardless of the shape of the sample, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal for one sample mean as long as the sample size is at least 30. The last possibility on our flowchart is if the population is not known to be normally distributed and the sample size is less than 30. Then we would go back to the bootstrapping and randomization procedures from lessons four and five. Our second learning objective here is to construct a confidence interval for a mean by hand given summary data. Again, what we're focusing on here is the t-distribution method. We'll be following the same general form of a confidence interval. The sample statistic is the sample mean symbolized by x bar. The multiplier, assuming that the assumptions are met, is going to come from the t-distribution. We'll look up this value in Minitab Express by constructing a t-distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. We'll look at some examples of this shortly, but the process is the same as it was when we constructed z-distributions. And the standard error for one sample mean is equal to the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Let's walk through a couple of examples using summary data. When I say summary data, what I mean is that you'll be given the mean and standard deviation for the sample, as opposed to being given a raw data set. Here's our first example. In a random sample of 50 students, the mean age was 31 years with a standard deviation of five years. Construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean age in the population of all students. I like to start by identifying all of the pieces of information that we have. The sample size is 50. Because our sample size is at least 30, we can use the t-distribution to construct this confidence interval. The sample mean is 31 years. The sample standard deviation is five years. And the confidence level is 95%. Here's our formula. We have x bar, s, and n, but we need the t multiplier. I'll take you to Minitab Express now to show you how to find that value. We'll need the degrees of freedom. For one sample mean, df equals n minus one. With a sample size of 50, 50 minus one gives us 49 degrees of freedom. In Minitab Express, I'll construct a t distribution with 49 degrees of freedom to find the t values that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. Just as we did when we found the z multipliers, we're going to construct a probability distribution plot to display probability. The default in Minitab Express is a z distribution. We need to change this to t and enter in our degrees of freedom, which were 49. We want to find the t values that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. We click OK. Our t multiplier is 2.00958. We plug these values into our formula. Our 95% confidence interval is 29.579 to 
To interpret this, I would say that I am 95% confident that the mean age in the population of all students is between 29.579 years and 32.421 years. Let's do one more example. In a random sample of 40 customers, the average amount spent was $20 with a standard deviation of $8. Construct a 90% confidence interval to estimate the mean amount spent in the population of all customers. The sample size is 40. Because our sample size is at least 30, we can use the t-distribution to construct this confidence interval. The sample mean was $20, and the sample standard deviation was $8. The confidence level we were given to be 90%. Here's our formula. We have x bar, s, and n, but we need the t-multiplier. Before we can look up the t multiplier, we need to compute the degrees of freedom. For one sample mean, df equals n minus 1. With a sample size of 40, 40 minus 1 gives us 39 degrees of freedom. In Minitab Express, I'll construct a t distribution with 39 degrees of freedom to find the t values that separate the middle 90% from the outer 10%. Just as we did when we found z multipliers, we're going to construct a probability distribution plot to display probability. We're constructing a t distribution, this time with 39 degrees of freedom. Confidence intervals are always two-tailed. This is a 90% confidence interval, so we need to find the values that separate the middle 90% from the outer 10%. We need to change the probability to the value that is split between the two tails. Our t multiplier is 1.68488. We plug these values into our formula. Because we're working with dollars here, I rounded to two decimal places. I am 90% confident that the mean amount spent in the population of all customers is between $17.87 and $22.13 per customer. Our third learning objective is to construct a confidence interval for a mean using Minitab Express given summary or raw data. First, I'll show you an example using the summary data from the last example that we looked at. We just saw this scenario. When we go to Minitab Express, we'll need the same pieces of information. Let's go there now. The steps are similar for a PC or Mac. Go to Statistics, One Sample, T. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, One Sample Inference, T. The default is that the sample data are in a column. But for this example, we have summary data. This will let us plug in the sample size, mean, and standard deviation. For this example, we had a sample size of 40, a sample mean of $20, and a sample standard deviation of $8. Under Options, we can change the confidence level. We want a 90% confidence interval estimating the population mean. Our 90% confidence interval for mu, the population mean, is 17.869 to 22.131. I'll do another example in Minitab Express, but this time using raw data. I'll use the bike commute data set again for this example. We've seen this data set earlier in this video. It's one that comes with the textbook. Be sure to open the MTW file. If you have Minitab Express installed on your computer, it should automatically open in Minitab Express. Let's say that I want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean top speed. Again, I'll go to statistics, one sample, t. 
These data are in the column Top Speed. Under Options, the default is 95%, so we don't need to change anything here. Click OK. This is our 95% confidence interval, estimating the mean top speed in the population. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides so we can move on to the fourth learning objective. Determine the necessary minimum sample size to construct a confidence interval for a mean. Here's the formula that we're going to use. Just as we saw with the formula to estimate n for a proportions confidence interval, this was derived from the formula for a confidence interval for a mean. If you're curious, you can pause the video here and look at this proof. M is the margin of error. This is what is added and subtracted from the sample mean when we construct our confidence interval. Z is the Z multiplier. This is used as an estimate of the T multiplier. We can't use the t-distribution because the t-distribution depends on the degrees of freedom, which depend on the sample size. Since we're estimating the sample size, we don't have n and can't compute the degrees of freedom. So we use z as an estimate of the multiplier. Sigma with a tilde is the estimated value of the population standard deviation. You need to have all three pieces of information in order to be able to compute the necessary minimum sample size for constructing a confidence interval for a mean. Let's look at one example. We want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean age of all students with a margin of error of two years. In a previous study, the standard deviation of students' ages was five years. Here, the margin of error is two years. The confidence level is 95%. Recall that the Z multiplier for a 95% confidence interval is 1.960. Or if you're applying the empirical rule, you could round this up to two. The sample standard deviation in a previous study was five years, and that's what we're going to use as an estimate of the population standard deviation. We can plug these values into our formula. And we find n equals 24.01. We can't have 0 0.01 of a person, so we always round up. Our minimum necessary sample size is 25. For our fifth learning objective, we are going to move to hypothesis testing. We will be using the same five-step hypothesis testing procedure as we did for one proportion. I'll run through these steps now, and then I'll do an example by hand. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption is that if the population shape is not known, the sample size is at least 30. Or, if the population is known to be normal, that the population standard deviation is not known. Our hypotheses will be written just as they were in Lesson 5. Here, the mu sub o is the hypothesized population mean. That will be replaced by an actual number when you write out your hypotheses. Step 2, compute the test statistic. We're going to be following the general form of a test statistic again. In the numerator, we have the sample statistic, which is the sample mean minus the null parameter, which is the hypothesized population mean. In the denominator, the standard error is equal to the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Step three, determine the p-value. Given that the null hypothesis is true, the p-value is the probability that a randomly selected sample of n would have a sample mean as different or more different than the one in our sample in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. We can look up the p-value using Minitab Express. We'll construct a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom 
The p-value will be the area under the t-distribution that is more extreme than the test statistic from step two in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Step four, make a decision. If the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, which in most cases is 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state a real world conclusion. This is where we go back to the original research question and state whether or not we have evidence of the hypothesized difference. If you reject the null, then the results are statistically significant and there is evidence of a difference in the population. If you fail to reject the null, then the results are not statistically significant and there is not evidence of a difference in the population. I'll walk through one example now. There are additional examples in the online notes. Whenever possible though, I recommend using Minitab Express, which you'll see in the next learning objective. Here's our research question. Is the average length of a visit to a certain store more than 10 minutes? Data were collected from a random sample of 40 customers. In that sample, the mean visit was 13 minutes with a standard deviation of four minutes. I like to start by identifying all pieces of information that we have. The hypothesized population mean is 10. The sample size is 40. The sample mean is 13. And the sample standard deviation is four. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. This is the flow chart that we use to determine if it is appropriate to use the t-distribution. Is the population known to be normally distributed? We are not given that information, so no. Is the sample size at least 30? Yes, the sample size is 40, so we should use the t-distribution. Next, we write our hypotheses. We want to know if the population mean is greater than 10 minutes. Our null is that the mean equals 10, and the alternative is that the mean is greater than 10. Step two, compute the test statistic. Here is our formula. We have all of these values from the prompt. We plug these values into our formula, and we get a t-test statistic of 4.743. Step three, determine the p-value. This is a right tail test with a t-test statistic of 4.743. The p-value will be the area on a t-distribution with n minus one or 39 degrees of freedom. I'll take you to Minitab Express now to look up that value. I'm going to construct a probability distribution plot to display the probability. We have a t-distribution with 39 degrees of freedom. This was a right tail test. We have a test statistic of 4.743. Our p-value is 0 0.0000140. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value is less than or equal to the standard 0.05 alpha level. We reject the null hypothesis. Step five, state a real world conclusion. We rejected the null hypothesis. There is evidence that the average length of a visit to this store is more than 10 minutes. For our next learning objective, conduct a hypothesis test in Minitab Express given summary or raw data. I'll take you to Minitab Express to do that last example again. The steps are similar for a PC or Mac. Go to Statistics, One Sample, T, if you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, One Sample Inference, T. The default, again, is that sample data are in a column, but for this example, we were given summary data. 
In this scenario, we were given that the sample size was 40, the sample mean was 13, and the sample standard deviation was 4. We are conducting a hypothesis test, so we need to check this box. The hypothesized population mean was 10. This is the value from our hypotheses. Under options, the default is to do a two-tailed test, but this was a right-tailed test. Our alternative was that mu was greater than 10. And the confidence level we can leave as the default 95 because we're interested in the hypothesis test here, not the confidence interval, though Minitab Express will give you both automatically. Click OK. In our output, we can confirm that we entered the sample data correctly and that we had set up the hypotheses correctly. Our test statistic is t equals 4.74 and our p-value is less than 0 0.0001. I'll do one more example in Minitab Express using raw data. I'm going to use the bike commute data set again. Let's say that our research question is, is the mean distance in the population different from 27? If we scroll down, we can see that our sample size is greater than 30, so we can use the t-distribution method here. I'll go to statistics, one sample, t. Now we do have our sample data in a column. They're in the column labeled distance. I want to conduct a hypothesis test with a hypothesized mean of 27. Under options, this is a two-tailed test, so we don't need to change anything here. In our output, we first have the descriptive statistics, then the hypotheses, and finally, a test statistic of t equals 4.19 and p-value of 0 0.0001. This is what this question would look like written up for your lab assignment. This is a good time to take another break. We've just covered all of the procedures associated with one mean. This is covered in section 6.2 of the LOC5 textbook. You may want to go to Wiley Plus to do all of the questions that are tied to Chapter 6, Section 2 before you move on to the last section. The last parameter that we're going to cover is paired means. This is covered in Section 6.5 of the textbook. Paired means were first introduced in Lesson 4. With paired samples, there are two observations for each case. These observations must be meaningfully matched. Usually this occurs when data are collected twice from the same participants. For example, a pretest, post-test design. But there could be different participants who are paired together meaningfully, such as brother-sister pairs or husband-wife pairs. If you need a review of paired versus independent samples, I recommend going back to lesson four. When data are paired, we compute the difference for each case and then treat those differences as if they are a single measure. Here's an example of that. This is a common pretest, post-test design. The same group of people took the same test two times. We have each person's pretest score and their post-test score. Maybe we want to know if, on average, test scores change from pre to post-test. What we're actually testing here is the difference. I took each student's pretest score minus their post-test score to compute their difference scores. A paired means t-test is essentially a single mean t-test on these differences. Our first learning objective for paired means is to identify situations in which the t-distribution may be used to approximate the sampling distribution. We'll refer to the central limit theorem again. If the sample size is sufficiently large, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. 
We'll use the same flowchart, but now we're looking at differences. If we know that the differences in the population are normal, and we know the standard deviation of the differences in the population, then we would use the z-distribution. I don't think I've ever seen this used in real life. If we know that the differences are normally distributed in the population, but we do not know the standard deviation of the differences in the population, then we would use the t-distribution. This is also rare. Most of the time, we will not know if the differences are normally distributed in the population, so it will come down to the sample size. If the sample size is at least 30, then we use the t-distribution. This is what we'll see most often in this lesson, and this is what you'll see most often in real life. If the sample size is less than 30, then we would use the bootstrapping and randomization procedures that we learned in lessons four and five. Our second learning objective for paired means is to construct a confidence interval for a mean by hand given summary data. Again, what we're focusing on here is the t-distribution method. We'll be following the same general form for a confidence interval. The sample statistic is the mean difference in the sample, symbolized by x bar with a subscript d. The multiplier, assuming that the assumptions are met, is going to come from the t distribution. We'll look up this value using Minitab Express by constructing a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Here, n is the number of pairs. The standard error for paired means is equal to the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of the sample size. Again, the sample size here is the number of pairs. Let's walk through one example using summarized data. Here, we want to construct a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean change in anxiety scores. I included a table showing the raw data so you can see how the different scores were computed. We have 30 participants, so we can use the t-distribution method. Each participant took the same anxiety survey two times. In the last column, I've computed their difference by taking their pre-score minus their post-score. Here, we're given the sample size, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation for these different scores. Here's our formula. We have all of these values except for the t-multiplier. To find the t-multiplier, we'll construct a t-distribution where the degrees of freedom will be equal to the number of pairs minus 1. We have 30 pairs of scores, giving us 29 degrees of freedom. I'll take you to Minitab Express now to find that t-multiplier. I'm going to construct a probability distribution plot to display the probability. We have a t-distribution with 29 degrees of freedom. We're constructing a 95% confidence interval. The 5% will be equally split between the two tails. Our t multiplier is 2.04523. We plug these values into our formula. This gives us a 95% confidence interval of 0 0.214 to 7.252. I am 95% confident that the mean decrease in anxiety scores in the population from pre to post test is between 0.214 points and 7.252 points. Our third learning objective is to construct a confidence interval for a mean using Minitab Express given summary or raw data. First, I'll show you an example using the summary data from the last example. 
There are two different ways that you could get this confidence interval using summary data. You could use the single sample method that we saw earlier, or the way that I'll show you is to treat it as paired samples. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to statistics, two samples, paired T. If you were on a Mac, it would be statistics, two sample inference, paired T. We have summarized data. Our sample size was 30, with a mean difference of 3.733, and a standard deviation of the differences of 9.425. Under options, we can see that the default is a 95% confidence interval. Click OK, and here's our 95% confidence interval for the mean difference in the population. Next, I'll show you how we could construct this confidence interval using the raw data. In an Excel file, I have the pre and post test scores that we saw in the earlier example. I can copy these and paste them into our Mini Tab Express worksheet. Again, I'll go to Statistics, Two Samples, Paired T. I'll call pretest scores Sample 1 and post test scores Sample 2. Under Options, the default is the 95% confidence interval. And here's our confidence interval again. Our fourth learning objective for paired means is to determine the necessary minimum sample size to construct a confidence interval. We use the same formula that we did for a single mean. I've just added the subscript D. I'll go over one quick example. What minimum sample size should be obtained to estimate the mean change in quiz scores from the beginning to end of the semester with a 95% confidence level and margin of error of plus and minus two points. The estimated standard deviation of the differences is four points. We are given the confidence level of 95%. This tells us that we should use a Z multiplier of 1.960. The margin of error is two points and the estimated value of the standard deviation of the differences in the population is four points. We plug these values into the equation, and we get n equals 15.366. We always round up when estimating minimum necessary sample sizes. Our minimum necessary sample size is 16. For our fifth learning objective, we are going to move to hypothesis testing. We will be using the same five-step hypothesis testing procedure. I'll run through these steps now, and then I'll do an example by hand. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. These are the same assumptions that we just saw for a paired means confidence interval, and the same that we saw for a single mean test. Most of the time, we won't know the shape of the population, so we'll be checking that we have data from at least 30 pairs. The hypotheses will be written just as they were in lesson five. The null will always be that mu sub d, which is the mean difference in the population, is zero, because that would mean that there is no difference in the population. The alternative will be not equal to, greater than, or less than, depending on the research question. Step two, compute the test statistic. We're going to be following the same general form of a test statistic again. In the numerator, we have the sample statistic, which is the mean difference in the sample, minus the null parameter, which for a paired means test is almost always zero. Sometimes you'll see this dropped off of the equation. In the denominator, the standard error is equal to the standard deviation of the differences in the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. Again, the sample size is the number of pairs. 
Step three, determine the p-value. We can look up the p-value using Minitab Express. We'll construct a t-distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. The p-value will be the area under the t-distribution that is more extreme than the t-test statistic from step two in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. For example, if we had a left-tailed test, the p-value will be the area less than our t-test statistic. Step four, make a decision. If the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, which in most cases is 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state a real world conclusion. This is where we go back to the original research question and state whether or not we have evidence of the hypothesized difference. If you reject the null, then the results are statistically significant and there is evidence of a difference in the population. If you fail to reject the null, then the results are not statistically significant and there is not evidence of a difference in the population. I'll walk through one example now. There are additional examples in the online notes. Whenever possible though, I recommend using Minitab Express, which you'll see in the next learning objective. I'm going to use the same data set that we saw earlier when constructing a confidence interval. We're given the sample size, the mean difference, and the standard deviation of the differences. We want to know, do anxiety scores change from pre to post test? Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. We were not given any information about the shape of the population, but the sample size is at least 30, so we can use the t-distribution method. We want to know if scores change. The null will be that the mean difference is zero. In other words, there is not a change in the population. And the alternative, because this is a non-directional test, will be that the mean difference in the population is not equal to zero. Step two, compute the test statistic. Here is our formula. In the numerator, we have the mean difference in the sample minus zero. The minus zero often drops off. And in the denominator, the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of the sample size. Our t-test statistic is 2.169. Step three, determine the p-value. The p-value will be the area under a t-distribution. The degrees of freedom are the number of pairs minus one. 30 minus one gives us 29 degrees of freedom. This will be a two-tailed test, so the p-value will be the area in both tails more extreme than 2.169. I'll take you to Minitab Express to find the p-value. I'm going to construct a probability distribution plot to display probability. We have a t-distribution with 29 degrees of freedom. Our test statistic is a specified x-value. This was a two-tailed test with a test statistic of 2.169. The p-value is the total area in the two tails. 0 0.0192113 plus 0 0.0192113 gives us a p-value of 0 0.0384226. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value is less than or equal to the standard 0.05 alpha level. We reject the null hypothesis. Step five, state a real world conclusion. We rejected the null hypothesis. There is evidence that anxiety scores change from pre to post test in the population. Our last learning objective 
is to conduct a hypothesis test in Minitab Express given summary or raw data. I'm going to do the same example in Minitab Express now, first with summarized data and then with the raw data. The procedures for hypothesis testing with paired means are actually the same as they were for constructing a confidence interval with paired means. I'll go to statistics, two samples, paired T. The first example, I'm going to enter summarized data. Our sample size was 30 with a mean of 3.733 and standard deviation of 9.425. This should look familiar because we followed the exact same procedure when we constructed the confidence interval earlier using summarized data. For paired means, there is no box to check to do the hypothesis test because the hypothesis test is always done using the null that mu sub d equals zero. Under options, the default alternative hypothesis is that the mean difference does not equal zero. In other words, it's a two-tailed test. This matches the test that we're doing here, but if you were doing a one-tailed test, you could select the left-tailed or right-tailed alternative hypothesis here. We'll click OK, and in the bottom table, we have our t-test statistic of 2.17 and p-value of 0.0384. Next, I'll show you how you could do this same test using raw data. In the worksheet below, I still have the pre and post test data in here from earlier when I did the confidence interval. Again, I'll go to two samples, paired T. I'll call the pretest sample one and the post test sample two. The default is our two tailed test. And again, at the bottom, we have our T test statistic and P value. I know this probably feels like we've covered a lot of content. I recommend paying attention to all of the similarities across these three parameters. I also recommend making a table to organize all of the assumptions and formulas for this week. Here's one example. There's another example in the online notes. You should have something like this on your one page of notes for the exams. Pay attention to the similarities. All of these confidence interval formulas are the sample statistic plus and minus the multiplier times the standard error. All of these test statistics are the sample statistic minus the hypothesized population parameter divided by the standard error. This is a long lesson, but there is a lot of repetition. If you have any questions as you're working through this week's assignments, please post them to the discussion board on Canvas.